next presenter is uh, a member of one of the most exclusive clubs on Earth. He's an astronaut, and he's flown aloft as only a few hundred other men and women ever have before in the history of mankind. But he's also walked outside. That means he stepped out into that dazzling void, not once, but three times on his last mission, and spent a total of 17 hours and 47 minutes out where only a few dozen humans have ever been before. So watch this. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, go for it. Engine start. Four, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Endeavour, expanding the International Space Station while creating a classroom in space. Houston Endeavour, where is the program? Roger roll, Endeavour. Houston now controlling the flight of Endeavour. The Space Shuttle begins its journey back into orbit. Endeavour rolling onto the proper alignment, heads down, wings level for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit, taking aim on the International Space Station for docking on Friday. 30 seconds into the flight, the three liquid fuel main engines will soon throttle back to 72% of rated performance in the bucket to reduce the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. This view from long-range trackers, now from a camera on the external fuel tank showing the bird's eye view of Endeavour heading towards space. 54 seconds into the flight, Endeavour already eight miles downrange, standing by for the throttle up call from Capcom, Chris Ferguson. Endeavour, go with throttle up. Go at throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Scott Kelly, joined on the flight deck by pilot Charlie Hobaugh, flight engineer Rick Mastracchio and Tracy Caldwell, Dave Williams, Al Drew and Barbara Morgan seated down on the mid deck, Morgan racing towards space on the wings of a legacy. Wow. Every time I see that I want to go fly. Absolutely incredible. Thanks very, very much. Seven and a half million pounds of thrust, lifting you from being stationary to traveling 25 times the speed of sound. Truly the ride of a lifetime. We're doing 10 kilometers a second when we're in space. You snap your fingers, the space shuttle's gone 10 kilometers, five times faster than your average rifle bullet. It's an amazing experience, and it's an experience that very, very few of us have had a chance to uh, really have, and I'd like to share that with you and get a sense for what it's like being part of these amazing, unique missions. Eight and a half minutes after we lift off, we have an image like this, absolutely spectacular. We've opened the payload bay doors of the space shuttle, we're looking down at the Pacific Ocean, the fine lattice work of clouds that you can see in the lower atmosphere as you're orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes. It's an amazing experience being part of that unique group of humans that's left the surface of the planet to be able to go and explore. What's truly remarkable about this, though, is that literally uh, 90 minutes after we lift off, we've gone around the world once and we're back over Florida looking down at Kennedy Space Center. There's the launch pad that we were on before we lifted off to go into space. The guests that came to watch us lift off are stuck in their cars in traffic <laughs> trying to get back to the hotel, you know. We've gone around the world once, they're still... <laughs> what can you do? Absolutely incredible. Yeah. But you know, it's a remarkable experience and watching a shuttle lift off is truly a, it's an emotional, it's a visceral experience. You're standing there, seven and a half million pounds of thrust, you feel the ground beginning to shake before you actually begin to hear the power of the three main engines and the two solid rocket boosters. The contrail that's left after we depart truly captures the imagination of everyone on the ground that's left looking at this void, wondering where we've gone, what we're doing as we go forward and explore space. And it's truly a time for all of us to reflect on the magnitude of uh, the accomplishment. My second space flight took place last August. We went to the International Space Station to help build the space station. 
Truly one of the remarkable stories about the space station is countries from all over the world, multiple cultures, languages, coming together to build the most incredible piece of technology in the history of the human species without fit checking at first, bringing these components together, plugging them together in space and that they actually work. Truly a remarkable achievement. But this time when I was uh, working in space, I had a chance to work directly with the Canadian contribution to the space program. All of us should feel really proud of the magnitude of this contribution. In this photograph, you can see all three robotic devices developed by the Canadian space program, McDonald Detweiler, here in Toronto. There's the shuttle, uh, cannon arm on the uh, side of the shuttle. Over here, we see the cannon arm for the sta space station. And right down here is the orbiter boom system, which is enabling uh, NASA to inspect the tiles on the undersurface of the orbiter. Very few of us in Canada recognize that the shuttle could not have returned to flight if it were not for the contribution of McDonald Detweiler in building this orbiter boom to inspect the tiles on the undersurface of the orbiter. But the true magic of flying in space occurs when you go outside. It's an unbelievable experience because now you're within your own spacecraft inside a pressurized spacesuit, 4.3 psi. You can hear your breathing as you take breath after breath, working over a course of six and a half, seven hours, building the space station, bringing things together. But truly what's spectacular is you have a chance to think about the magnitude of what you're doing. And I remember standing on the end of the arm on our second spacewalk, looking at this incredible view of the Earth, feeling incredibly proud to be wearing the Canadian flag on the side of my spacesuit, riding an arm that's got Canada proudly displayed on the side of it, looking at the payload bay of the space shuttle with Canada on one side on the robotic arm, Canada on the boom, and thinking, wow, what a unique experience to be here, to be representing our country as one of the major spacefaring nations of the world. It was truly, truly a remarkable experience. The view, of course, is out of this world. <laughs> eh, what's not better? You know, I was up all night trying to figure out what I... Anyway. <laughs> it's my attempt at being a comedian. But the view is truly remarkable, and you're riding on the end of the arm, you know, you're traveling 10 kilometers a second, and you do have moments to actually look at the Earth beneath you. We could get into a whole discussion about whether it's above you or beneath you, but the bottom line is the view is tremendously compelling. Another picture taken when we're over the Pacific Ocean with the clouds in the background, absolutely spectacular. But you know, every 45 minutes, you get to see a sunset and a sunrise. <laughs> People ask me, has spaceflight ruined anything for you? <laughs> yeah, I have no patience for transatlantic flying. I, you know, what, <laughs> <laughs> what is the deal? Anyway. The other thing, though, is that when you look down on the Earth, you see different types of effects of human habitation. And, of course, you see examples of pollution. This is a picture of Shenyang, China. And needless to say, you can appreciate the snow around the city, but you can also appreciate the catastrophic effect that pollution is having. And you can see, of course, plumes of smoke in the atmosphere as uh, industries keep uh, putting various compounds out into the air itself. And again, it makes you sit back and reflect. You know, you're, you're standing on the end of an arm, you're working, doing a spacewalk, building the space station, you see images like this, and it gives you pause to reflect on what is it that we're actually doing here on the Earth. What happened with us, we're thinking these lofty thoughts about the human condition and everything, and then we find out, boom, we have damaged tile on the undersurface of the orbiter. This damage is about the size of the palm of my hand. Mission Control is calling us. They're worried. They're worried whether or not Endeavour is going to survive the re-entry process when the temperature of the tiles heats up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Mission Control calls us up and they said, well, we have data. In space, we don't take chances, we manage risk. To manage risk, you have to have data. They had the data. They got the results. They found out that by doing thermal art jet testing, that the exposed aluminum, which all of you can see, that's exposed aluminum right there, was going to get up to a temperature of 300 degrees Fahrenheit during the re-entry process. And they said that based on their analysis, weighing the risks of going to repair the tile versus leaving the tile as it is, the best thing to do from a risk management perspective is leave the tile alone. Well, the media calls up, and we're doing this live downlink, Scott Kelly and myself, and the reporter was very concerned about what was happening with this damaged tile. So Scott Kelly, our commander, in his very unique way, says, well, <clears throat> 
Let me answer the question that you have about the tile. About 10 days before going into space, my daughter says, Dad, can we have a pizza? So Scott says, sure, why? He goes to the freezer, pulls out a pizza, flips it over, you know, and looks on the back, says, well, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, okay, 20 minutes, not a problem. Goes over to the oven, puts 400 degrees, throws it in. 20 minutes later, boom, the pizza comes out, and the aluminum pizza pan survived as well. <laughs> And as we go forward and explore space and look at the overall impacts of the program and what we're going to be doing in the next 10 to 15 years, we have very lofty goals. We imagine sending humans farther into space beyond the era of the International Space Station. This time we imagine sending humans back to the moon, having them live and work in this unique environment. And this time we'll be doing it with crews of three, potentially six individuals, 24-7. 365 days a year. Imagine being in a lunar habitat in this environment, looking back and seeing an earth rise every day. Working in this environment, representing those first astronauts that are reaching out from the planet Earth to live on another body within our solar system. For the first time in the history of the human species, we will have humans living on another planetary body full time when we go back to the moon. When is this going to happen? It'll happen before 2019, hopefully, before the 50th anniversary of Apollo, having humans living and working in this unique environment. The legacy that we all leave is up to each of us. And I think we can make many choices about the role and the, the things that we can do. But I would like to leave you with one thought. Enjoy every moment that you have here on Earth. It's a beautiful, tremendous planet. And with all of us working together, we can preserve it for future generations. Thanks very, very much. We've already observed several times at this conference that Canadians don't like to make a fuss. And and we take our heroes and heroics with a large grain of salt. But if you ask me, this is the real deal. And I think we should give them a standing ovation. <laughs> Doctor. Hey. I'll stay with you. And, and. If If, if, you would remain, if you would remain standing and turn towards the back of the hall, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, David Onley. Now, but by, now, by now people know the story that David first rose to prominence in our community because he was the weather guy on City TV. I <laughs> hired him as the weather guy at City TV. But what you may not know is that I was actually first attracted to David because he was at that time uh, making a career for himself as a space journalist. And so I think it is perfect that David Meet David, <laughs> and it's great to have you both here. Thank you so much. <laughs>